my life was in total chaos and it made no sense to me at all. But now, now I'm beginning to understand what on earth God is doing in my life. What on earth is God doing in your life? I hope by now you have a good handle on one thing that he may be doing in your life because he made you to do something he didn't make anybody else to do. And when you begin to understand that God, the Father, is the vine dresser of this beautiful vineyard that we've made just for this course, and that he was the one who acts on all these branches to help them bear from no fruit to fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And so far in our course, we've tried to help you understand that he fashioned you to do something that he decided that he wanted somebody to do before he created the world. And that he then thought of what that kind of person needed to be like, when they needed to live, where they needed to be alive at, who their parents need to be, and if they had brothers and sisters, and how smart they were, or what they were good at, just to, as we talked about, to do those good works on this line of the divine plan of God. And then we spent two sessions on a challenging topic, and I just want to express appreciation, because I dealt with a difficult topic. What does it mean to take away? And during lunchtime, we were in the back room and I was having a cup of coffee and sitting and talking to my wife and a couple of my friends came in and they said, that was a challenging topic. I said, I know. I said, how was it? Well, you can't argue with what the Greek says. It's right there in black and white. I said, yeah, but that's a delicate topic. And then I said this to them, to my friends. I said, when I was trying to decide, let me borrow this for a minute, what to do with this course, I had to decide, do I have the right to skip verses that are challenging? Because he's the one who gave the content. And if he gave it, he doesn't want me to skip the verses because they're harder to deal with. And I hope by now you understand that when Jesus talked about if a branch in me, which is a believer, bears no fruit for a, for a period of time, that God, who sees this continuing habit, finally realizes, oh, this thing fell down into the dirt. And he doesn't want it in the dirt. It's unhealthy. This person in the dirt is never happy. You just aren't. So he comes along with his bucket as the vine dresser, picks up this branch, cleans it up, pats it down, and ties it back into the sun. Why? He doesn't want it here. He wants it to move over here to, to the beginning of fruit. Well, now we're on the second part of this. What does God do to a branch that's not in the dirt anymore that's bearing fruit? Because ultimately, Jesus revealed something about his father. He said, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. This is the picture that the father has in mind and Jesus is revealing that's what my father wants. And since the father is the vine dresser and is responsible to generate the maximum amount of fruit, he comes back to this, this branch who has some fruit. Things are starting to turn around. And my question is, what does he do to move a branch from here to here, from fruit to more fruit? And in these two sessions, we're going to pull back that veil that Jesus Christ opened when he revealed, here's what my dad does when this takes place in a person's life. So take a look at your workbook and let's get into this. A session deals with what does God do in your life when you start bearing fruit? I want to read Titus chapter three and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. All right, part one. What does the vine dresser do when he prunes? Let's read that passage together right beneath part number one. Let's read it together. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, except by the one that bears fruit, already 
So when a person moves out of the no fruit season, uh, the father uh, gets rid of the bucket. It doesn't need it anymore. It doesn't need to tie back up that branch. The branch is back on the trellis. Instead, he picks something up that uh, clips things off. Oh, I don't know which is better, the bucket or the clippers. Whoa, it's a good question. He prunes. What does it mean to prune? <laughs> Can I do one? He prunes, not the vine. Never prunes the vine. You always prune a branch. What's a branch? A believer. <laughs> really? He uses this. Yeah. This is a pruning tool. And uh, this, is, this is getting in the way. Whoa. Ah! What'd you do? Excuse me. I just pruned you. Well, wh what did I do wrong? What? What did I do wrong? Who said you did something wrong? Oh, uh, this leaf here, that's taking too much sap. Uh, this is going to be a waste right here. No, I don't want that. Nope. What does the branch do when things are cut off? It screams. What did I do wrong? Answer, nothing. What? You're doing something wrong over there. You're doing something right here. What am I doing right? I'm bearing fruit. And it prunes so that it will bear more fruit. This piece of wood takes sap that comes up that vine and gets into the branch. And instead of going into grapes, it goes into wood. It takes sap I need for more grapes. So I'm getting rid of it. Until you understand that is precisely what the Father does to you and to me when we're doing some things right. When we're bearing fruit, he acts in a way that still hurts. And so what happens is people don't understand that this is not the same as this. That chastening is because of my sin hurts and pruning is because of my obedience and it hurts and therefore everybody thinks it's always because of something I did wrong when Jesus says oh no it isn't no it isn't sometimes it's because you're doing a lot right so I can't wait to teach this to you this changed my life a lot a lot because I never understood there were two things when things were painful, I always concluded I must have sin in my life somewhere that's causing this. Have you ever thought that way? All right, let's get into it then. Point number one, every branch that bears fruit describes a fruit bearing believer. God, Jesus isn't talking about non-Christians here. That it may bear more fruit reveals God's primary goal in pruning. What does he want? more fruit, not more stick, not more leaves. What happens to a vineyard that's left to itself? Do you know? I didn't know because I never grew up around this. But when our children were young, we made a decision as a family to move way out to the country. And we were able, by saving all of our little bit of money we had, to buy an old rundown farm that nobody else seemed to want. And it had a barn that has big holes in it. And it was uh, inside this barn was an old, old, older than me, old tractor. And I uh, loved riding a tractor because I could bush hog. You know what bush hog is? When you cut the things behind the tractor with a great big lawnmower. I loved it because you could actually see you were doing something. And this was a big piece of property. It had a lot of hectares in it. And I was just cleaning it, clearing it up, just using the bush hog and having a ball. The, the wheels, where high, high is this? It must have been a 60-year-old tractor. And I went to one area of the farm I hadn't even been to before. And I'm cutting it, and all of a sudden, I see some red. It was in the middle of the summer. And lo and behold, there was a vineyard underneath all these weeds. Ah, 
nobody told me about this. So I turned off the tractor and I got it down. I said, look at all this. Look how these vines are big. Man, they're, for, they're all over the place. And I went down and I picked up a cluster and they were small grapes. And I said, well, I've never seen one this small before. This must be a different kind of grape than I've ever tasted. <laughs> and I put it in my mouth and it was so sour, I actually spit it back on the ground. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh, what kind of grape is this? And uh, the next week I was uh, outside working and the next door neighbor come over and I said to him, I didn't know there was a vineyard here. Oh, yeah, many years ago. The previous owner had a great vineyard, but it's been like that for 10 years. I said, the grapes are terrible. <laughs> he starts laughing. No, they're not terrible. They haven't been pruned. So what do you mean? He said all the sap went into growing these long, long branches and all these leaves, and there wasn't any sap left over for the grapes. And I ran right into this truth. If you want more, you have to have less. If you want more grapes, you have to have less branch and less leaves. And we get excited about the leaves. And God doesn't. So let's get on to this. The next point, number three. He prunes, specifies that the pruning agent is God the Father. To prune is a careful act. Underline those two words. It's a careful act of the vine dresser to cut back, to cut back, to produce more. Now, what happens to a person who goes through some of his pruning who doesn't understand what God's doing? You'll misinterpret God. God's trying to help you bear more by cutting back some things that don't make any difference. 4.1. Pruning is the primary method to make branches or Christians more productive. So when you pray this prayer, dear God, I want to do more for you. <laughs> do you know what you're asking God to do? <laughs> I want to do what you do. Okay, I've been waiting for that. I'm so glad to hear. And then we say, what did I do wrong to deserve that? This will change your life. I, I'd change mind because I misunderstood all of this. So next point, 4.2, pruning redirects the sap from the vine, from excess wood, leaves, and shoots, little tiny outgrowths, to fruit. There's only so much sap coming up the vine into the branch. And if it's being wasted by things that aren't fruit, the father wants to get rid of some. Number 4.3, pruning takes considerable expertise so as not to harm the branch. 4.4, pruning occurs numerous times throughout the season. I want you to understand something very important. No vine dresser comes and prunes and prunes and prunes and prunes and prunes and prunes because the branch will die. So at different times, different times in the year, a vine dresser comes along and cuts certain things out and then leaves it alone. Then it grows some more and comes back and cuts something different out. So it happens at different times, not all the time. Next point, 4.5. Pruning uses different tools in order to prune most effectively. And we're going to go through the tools that God uses in a human's life to prune them. Now, I want you to star number 4.6. It's the deepest truth I'm going to teach you in this section. Pruning occurs at certain times, but the fruit or the result of the pruning only sprouts later. That's an important observation. That is, when a vine dresser comes along and cuts certain things out, you don't see all of a sudden this cluster of grapes growing larger and you don't see a brand new cluster showing up. It's because the sap now begins to move differently in the branch or in your life, and later on, there's more fruit coming out. And here's what most people do. They say later on, when they begin to notice things have changed a lot, I don't know what happened. My life is just so, I'm able to do so much more for God, and they forgot, that's why. And if you don't understand 
there's time between pruning and the fruit. You'll get discouraged. So when I'm going through a period of pruning, I know later on, I'm going to look back at this season and say, oh man, I'm so glad I went through that. Because nobody likes going through pruning when it's happening to you. Okay, next point, point number five. You are already clean. Remember in the text, look at verse number three. You are already clean because the word in which I have spoken to you. When Jesus said you are already clean, he's talking about Christ having pruned them through his word. It's a scripture that prunes you a lot of times and makes you clean. And he's talking to his disciples at that point. Part number two, if you start bearing fruit, which is right, what does God do? Hopefully by now you're clear on that, but I want to go a little deeper with you. Number one, God's pruning seeks to stimulate you, to change something in you, to focus on bearing more fruit purposefully, on bearing more fruit purposefully. What does that mean? When you're on this side and there's just some fruit, you typically just respond to maybe some opportunities that happen to you. But as you're pruned more and more, you know what happens to you. You become focused on good works yourself in your mind. You begin looking for places and for people that you can do a good work for. Over on that side, you don't. You just respond to a crisis. On this side, you understand that's why I'm here. This is my life here. He made good works ahead of time for me to do for him, and I'm hunting for them all the time. It's very different, isn't it? One's reactive and one's proactive. It's proactive. So that's what begins to happen to you. Point 1.1, 1. 1. unlike chastening, pruning isn't because you've done something wrong, but because you've done something right. 1.2, Unlike chastening, pruning seeks to increase the good works you already are doing. Point number two, God's pruning seeks to channel your life due to a deeper, eternal perspective. You see your life differently. You understand the purpose of my life is to do those good works. Point number three, I want to camp out on this for a minute because this is what God does. God's pruning seeks to reallocate, to redirect your primary resources of your life. Look up here for a minute. What, what, what resources do I have in my life? I have time. That's what you do too. I have some of this. You do too. And I got some abilities that I can do. And so do you. That's what I have. What else do I have? Uh, I don't know. I have influence? Good. That's a good one. I do. So do you. But the big ones. Well, what are you going to do with your time? Is your time going to be invested for this? Is your talent going to be invested more for this? Do you understand where I'm going? Okay. So point number three. God's pruning seeks to reallocate or redirect your primary resources for greater productivity. And if you've been around 10 long, you hear me talk about that all the time. How do you double your church, your business, your personal productivity? How do you multiply it? How do you break through to the next level? Why is all that there? Because of this. You're supposed to become more productive. So point number 3.1, pruning seeks to encourage you to redirect your time. If your time doesn't change, what you do with your evenings and your weekends, over time, it should change. You should be focusing on what I want to do. For instance, do you have a time in the week that you just do good works? You lead a Bible study. You go take care of some kids. Do you go visit some poor people who don't have enough food and bake some for them? Do you take like a Thursday night? and say, I'm going to use Thursday nights from now on. And I'm going to be looking all the time for a good work that needs to be done. And on Thursday night, I'm going to go do that. That's what happens with your time. 
Number 3.2, pruning seeks to encourage you to redirect your talents. Your talents. And I teach you about this in How to Double. And I want to tell you a story that happened to our family. We take vacations. We believe in vacations because when God told Israel about their work, he said, I want you to take three weeks of vacation every year. We went down to the beach. And on Sunday, we wanted to go visit a church. And we didn't know anybody. And so we just found the church that we were near we were staying. And I uh, wanted to remain anonymous as much as I could on vacations. And when you're well known, it's hard to do that. And so we would just go sit in the back row as a family, and I would just kind of try to hope to fade in the woodwork so that I could get something out of it. And afterwards, it was a great service, and the church was packed. It was packed. Then we were on our way out, and the pastor was there at the door, as typically pastors are, and I said to him, that was terrific today. You ministered to all of our family. Thank you so much. I said, your church is packed. And he said, have we met? I said, no, no, we haven't met. And I'm just having a vacation. And thanks so much. He said, no, wait, 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 wait. Your face. Well, he had read some of our books, and finally um, we were talking a little bit. And I said to him, uh, wow, your church is packed. He said, do you know, want, to, want to know what happened? Yes, what happened? He said, a while ago, I was at the door saying goodbye, and one of the men who lives here, and has a big national company, was on his way out and was shaking my hand. I said to him, you're going you're gonna to have to stand accountable to Jesus for this. The man said, what? He said, yeah, you are. For what? For not using your talents. He said, the man said, what talents are you talking about? I says, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm in marketing. I help big companies grow. I said to this man, well, then why don't you use this, the, your talent to double this church? To double this church? Yeah. And then the pastor said, would that be hard for you? Well, of course not. You only have 200 people here. I wouldn't even give that to a VP. I'd give that to a starting person. <laughs> Going from 200 and asking for 200 new customers? How hard is that? <laughs> and the pastor said to him, well, then do it. And the guy said, you want me to double your church? Yeah, I thought it's your church too. Well, it is my church. Well, can you? Of course. Will you? Okay, I will. He said within 30 days he had doubled the church. <laughs> Think about what you're hearing. That's a man who has a gift of, and a talent of marketing and never had dreamt in his mind <laughs> to use that talent for more fruit. What's your talent? Then are you using it? for more fruit.